the AA.ie. Cloudy tonight with outbreaks of rain, mainly in the western half of the country. There will also be mist on hills and in coastal areas. Lows of 10 to 14 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off the Ball with Paddy Power. Remember sport, that thing you used to love? It's back. Gamble responsibly. See dunlewy.net. I'm prepared to end it in my car. Well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <gasps> Why should there be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. All right, it is Tuesday's football show. We'll talk to Kevin Kilban a little bit later on in the show about the weekend's Premier League and today's games as well. In a moment, we'll be joined by Katie McCabe and Risha Littlejohn, two Republic of Ireland internationals. But there is football ongoing. It is injury time at the end of the first half at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium and still scoreless between Spurs and West Ham in that London derby. Though Spurs did have the ball in the back of the net just a moment ago. Hyung Min Son thought he had broken the deadlock. But VAR intervened and a matter of millimetres, he was offside, so the goal was disallowed. No goals either in the early game. That was between Leicester City and Brighton. Brighton missed a penalty in the first half. Aaron Connolly, the Republic of Ireland striker, was brought down, but Neil Mopé's penalty kick was saved by Casper Schmeichel. So no goals in either game so far. We will have more on that anon. But I'm delighted to be joined on the line by Republic of Ireland internationals Katie McCabe and Arisha Littlejohn. How are we getting on? Hey, how are you? Very well, very well. You have teamed up with Aviva and belong to ahead of Pride 2020 and people have been asked to shine a light from their homes this Friday to show their support for Pride 2020. The Aviva Stadium lighting up on Friday as well as Aviva team up with Belong to Youth Services in donating €50,000 to the LGBT community. Uh, Katie and Marisha, people might remember, around this time last year revealed publicly for the first time uh, that they were a couple. And it's brilliant to talk to you both and we'll get on to your football career in just a moment going back 12 months ago then when you decided to come out publicly and reveal publicly as well that you were a couple Katie for you how big a moment was that yeah it was it's a great moment um, to be given the opportunity by Aviva to obviously use our platform in a, a really positive way and um, was fantastic and I think it's it's only helped a lot of people since since a year ago and uh, it'll continue to help a lot more people hopefully in the future. I assume, Katie, uh, your family and friends, this wasn't new news to them? No, no, they've obviously known about myself and Rusha um, obviously the last few years and that and about myself over the last number of years again. And um, they've always been very supportive, um, but it was just the right time, I think, for us to then obviously make a statement and and show people who might be struggling uh, that it's okay to be themselves. Was it something you felt you needed to do as Ireland captain, as somebody with a bit of a public profile, that this was a story that people would be interested in? Or was it just that the timing was right and that you felt that actually now was a time where publicly you wanted this to be out there? Yeah, I think I've got a responsibility not only as captain of Ireland, but as a person. Um, I'm not afraid to, to be who I am and... Um, I'm, all I want to do is obviously try to help people um, and obviously using the platform I have in a positive way is, is what's really important to me. And Marisha, in terms of helping people, what has the reaction been like over the last year? Over the last year, you know, right as soon after we came out to, to everyone in Ireland, you know, it was really, it was really positive. We had, um, I think our, our phones were pinging, weren't they? Hmm. Uh, with a lot of people just getting in touch, um, people that we knew, family, friends, and then um, people then just on Instagram, they were messaging us, uh, just saying, look, well done, and like people were really, really happy because, um, you know, it's encouraging other people to then follow in our footsteps and start to come out. So for us, it was really positive feedback. Yeah, no, it was. Were there any fears? Are, are we still at a stage where you, you would have fears about coming out and, and what the reaction might be? Was that, was that part of your mindset at all, Arisha? I think because the two of us are so open now and we're so comfortable, we weren't really concerned about that at all. We just thought, let's go for it. Hopefully it will be positive. And fortunately enough for us, it was very positive. Um, and there was no backlash at all. So, you know, we're quite fortunate with that. But if there was, you know, we'd, I think we'd just take it in our stride and we'd have to go on with it. Um, but it's been positive. So let's hope, you know, doing this again and this being out there again is going to help more people. 
I'm sure as well you've probably received any amount of correspondence over the last year, the fact that you came out quite publicly and there was so much publicity around that time and how you've been, I'm sure, an inspiration to a lot of people. Have you, have you found that, Katie? Have you had a lot of letters, a lot of people getting in touch with you over the last year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, obviously, social media is a great thing in terms of people, obviously, um, getting in contact with you. And um, we've both received a lot of, um, like, DMs and stuff on Instagram of people sharing their stories um, with us. Um, not, of not just people of the younger generation, but people that are older as well. Um, so for that, for us, like that was really inspiring. Um, it showed us like what we done helped that at least one person, um, which is what we wanted to do. Mm. And for you, Risha, I'm sure uh, one of the real positives then over the past year is that sort of impact that you've had on people's lives. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's nice. Even like the first message I probably got, I was like, oh, God, that that's really nice. Mm. And then the more you get, you're like, right, this is actually making a difference. So this that is worth why I'm doing. I mean, obviously, if it's one person, that's great, but the fact that there's been quite a few people reaching out, I don't actually know the number, but there's been several people reaching out and just saying, you know, well done, that's great, and telling us about their story. It's, it's been nice, so it's nice to have that effect and help people through, through difficult times. If you compare a female player coming out to a male player, and we're still waiting right now, there's no publicly gay players within the men's Premier League like from the outside women's football would, be look, would look to be a very accepting community and then you compare it to the men's game and why it hasn't happened and on the one hand there's probably the fear of how supporters would react and in a very toxic environment what sort of abuse you would receive but the other would be that a Premier League player would come out right now there'd be a level of expectation that they would be something of a gay rights figurehead that they would automatically need to be an articulate spokesperson for a, a gay rights movement from from your point of view were you comfortable with talking about this were you always comfortable that you would be that inspirational figure was that something that came quite naturally to you over the last year yeah i think so like i think obviously um since last year it's been terrific but in terms of how we've dealt with it as Rusha said, we've, we've just taken everything in our stride. It's, it's nothing we've hid from um, all the years. We've always been really open with um, our friends, families, teammates, um, coaches. Like It's nothing we, we, we hid from people mm. at all. So for, for us, it's been quite easy. But for those people that it's not easy for, there's a lot of, like obviously with Aviva teaming up with the Belong to Youth mm. Services, like that is a massive support mechanism for people that are struggling um, and that needs help and maybe they can't reach out to their, their friends or family, um, but they could use those types of services. When you do look at the Premier League then and the lack of publicly gay footballers, do you think, and it's brilliant to hear you've had such a positive experience, do you think they're right to be worried and fearful if they were to come out as to what the public reaction would be? I think, you know, you compare guys' football to women's football and everyone knows that, you know, the men's football has got such a huge following with a, like a massive fan base. So, yeah, they're going to probably get a, a tougher time from, you know, opposition fans. Maybe, maybe that is part of the reason why people don't want to come out. But um, I think at the same time, we've all got to respect that maybe they don't want to come out, they're not ready to, maybe it's timing. Maybe they just want to keep their lives private because they are such high-profile mm. players these days. So it's just something I think everyone's got to respect. But I'm sure when the time is right, someone will uh, eventually come out and happily be, you know, the the face of uh, like men's football uh, being gay. Mm. How have you found the last three months? Then you're obviously living together at the moment, uh, lockdown. Everyone's spending a lot of time with their families. Uh, patients can wear thin from time to time. How have you found it? Well, we're still here talking to you, so <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's said a lot. Um, but now, on a serious note, it's been obviously really difficult for everyone. Um, but for us, obviously, trying to maintain a, a good balance of, of training and structure in our day obviously helps a lot. And for a while, there was that unknown of our league ending, or will it go ahead, will it won't? It, won't, it might not, sorry. Um, but, yeah, we've just been training and kind of keeping that competitiveness up um, in our sessions and... Um, yeah, there's been a few arguments along the way, no doubt. But, uh, yeah, that's because uh, we're both, uh, yeah, we both want to win, I guess. Yeah, it, talk to us about that then and the season finishing early and not getting an opportunity to end the season and it was so tight with a number of teams at the top of the league. Uh, did you get a sense very early on in this, Katie, that 
the season wasn't going to end, that financially it wasn't really viable to continue to the end of the season? Do you know what? It was actually so up in the air. Um, it was one of those where it was just week by week you were you were just waiting to hear whether we had more news on it. And obviously the FA couldn't make any um, announcements or um, put any structure in place to, for the league to finish, obviously because they were waiting for the UK government to, to make those guidelines. So for me, I was disappointed that I couldn't finish. I would have liked to, to finish it out and see where... Um, also, as a club, we could have finished in a possible uh, Champions League spot as well. And mm. There was a lot of games to go. So, for me, I'm disappointed. I would have liked to finish it personally. But um, I think what we need to remember is, obviously, the health and safety of, of players, staff, officials. Um, and, and yeah, it's obviously, they've, they've made the right call with it. How did the club, how did Arsenal look after you over the few months? Well, they've been fantastic. Um, we've gotten, obviously really early on um, at the start of lockdown we've been obviously delivered uh, weights and, and kits and footballs and obviously everything to help keep our uh, our training going but the support network as well with the club has been fantastic if if you are feeling anxious um, we, we had those kind of support networks there in place um, which is really really helpful um, but no Arsenal are, um, they've been fantastic over the whole course of the, the, the last few weeks so I'm hoping now to just kind of get back into pre-season and we can kind of get back to normal. What about you, Ruisha? Uh, you're with West Ham. You're out of contract now. You're going to move on. Do, do you know where you're going yet? Um, I've got a rough idea. I've got a rough idea, but I can't see right ah, now. Come nothing, on. Uh, I, can, I can leave you to press tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, nothing's been finalised, but hopefully everything's OK. And um, hopefully by the end of this week, things should be sorted. So right. we'll, see. we'll see then. Was it a worrying time in any way then, being out of contract and finishing up at West Ham at a time when everything's in such a state of flux and nobody really knows when football might resume? I think at the start it, it was okay, but then the longer it was going on, you start going, right, what's, what's going to happen here? Because um, obviously if, if, if there was game time, I was looking, going, there's games here, you know, I can really, I can get a contract here. Obviously, then that that wasn't going to happen. So you're going right. What what's what's happening next? And it's a shame because I think there's a lot of girls in similar positions. Mm. And you know, I think some clubs will be affected by 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 this. And financially, it's going to hit some teams. So there might not be as big squads. And you know, I think I know a few girls myself, and they're going right. Where's what's the next option here? So it's a shame how it's happened. But hopefully, it's just for this year, and you know, things will return to normal again. And have you got a sense from when you've been talking to clubs as to how much of a financial hit it's going to be, like in terms of your expectations, what a contract might look like? Is the women's game, do you feel it's going to suffer quite badly when it restarts? I think maybe, I think some of the, maybe not, I think your Arsenal's, Man City's, Chelsea's, and the bigger teams will probably be, you know, they'll find it easier. But I think the teams that maybe aren't, aren't as big, um, they, they will struggle a bit more. Um, obviously it helps if you've got money behind you it really does for um, getting players in and offering bigger contracts um, I think what will obviously help going forward as well with the FA kind of backing us backing the, the Women's Super League as mm. a whole um, going forward it's so important I mean women's football has made leaps and bounds in the last few years and we want to continue that way as well and Obviously, the, even the Euros now getting pushed back a year. Um, I think they really want to make sure it's the only uh, major tournament of, of that summer and really want to do it right as well. So hopefully with the support of the FA and uh, we can keep going and, and keep yeah just keep striving to, to where we want to get to with women's football. Yeah, you really would hope that they can continue to build on that momentum that was gained from particularly England performing so well at the World Cup a couple of years ago and the interest levels and the crowds that were starting to go to games that the hit taken by the clubs overall doesn't impact on the women's game and, and maybe with what you're saying with the FA's interest that's there as well and again, these are multi-billion pound football clubs that they should be in a position to support a women's team. From from an Arsenal point of view then, Katie, uh, you've lost your old mate. Louise Quinn has uh, finished up. Uh, she, she did all right while she was there. I, she's had an unbelievable uh, few years at Arsenal. She's always given it 100% in the shirts. Um, for me, I'm, I'm losing not just a teammate, but a really good friend as well. Um, she's As I said, she's been a top-class professional um, over the years and She's helped me massively, um, not just on the pitch, but off the pitch as well. 
um, even on the Ireland side of things as well. Um, but from chatting to her, she won't be getting rid of me too easy. Um, obviously, we've still got a, a lot of business left to do with, with Ireland and we've a, a really important campaign to finish as well. So I'll still be wrecking her head, no doubt. Ruisha, you're uh, slightly the more senior of uh, the two of you and a bit more experienced and been around football that little bit longer. In terms of how it has changed in English football, and I know you've been through quite a few clubs over the years, in terms of how it's changed over the last couple of years and that momentum we're talking about and the interest levels, what are the things that really stand out for you and how the game has progressed? I think um, with teams now going to a professional, that, you know, there's a full-time environment there and that is, you know, taking the game to like a new level. Um, it's a lot more competitive. You know, the girls are, they're fitter, they're faster, they're stronger. You know, you're now working two times a week or maybe more in the gym, so you're building up your strength. And, you know, that's been massive, I think, for the women's game. Um, it really has come on leaps and bounds. And I think it's still, it's still you know, it's still progressing. But um, I think that over the last seven seven years, that that's really when it started to... You're really showing your age. No? I know, I know. <laughs> I think I look well for my age while well, doing this lighting, <laughs> but I mean... Um, yeah, but no, it really has. It's came on a long way, and you know, hopefully, it can keep progressing. Um, but I think you know, even even some stadiums now are starting to get bigger crowds, and that's great. You know, it's great that people are starting to you know really start to watching. And I think with the, the girls coming through, there's such a loads of young girls that are yeah. so interested, and they can make a career out now. You know, that that's their job. They have the chance to make football their job, mm. and yeah, that's great. I was over at um, the Manchester City Chelsea game covering the Premier League match, and they played the Women's Super League game before it in the stadium beside the Etihad Stadium. It was a packed house. I think there was about five and a half, six thousand. It was a really entertaining game. And you're looking at that and the possibilities that are there. And because it was linked in with the men's game, there was a huge crowd around. There were a lot of people three hours before the game looking for something to do. Didn't cost a huge amount to get in. Really entertaining football. Katie, how much do you want, do you think, should the women's game be linked with the men's game? Is there a benefit to it? Or is there a sense that actually you don't want to live in the shadow, even if it is quite a big shadow, you don't want to be there, you want to stand on your own two feet? I've been... Uh, I've played a... Uh, sorry, from last summer, we uh, we obviously had a pre-season game against Bayern Munich. That was in the Emirates Cup. Mm. And we obviously played before the men's team. And that in itself was an unbelievable experience. Like, it was my first time playing at the Emirates and, um, yeah, I'll never forget it. But on the flip side of things, we had a game against, obviously, Spurs at Spurs Stadium where it was solely just a women's football game. And I think we got, like, 40-odd thousand uh, people coming to watch the game. And I think that, the emphasis on it's just a women's game, and you're, you're, you've got people coming in of 40 odd thousands to come in and watch the game. It's that was a bit more special because they're coming to see us. They might see the Arsenal supporters. Yeah, they're obviously coming to see the men again. But um, I think it was just a little bit more special that they were coming to see us and coming to see the first North London derby at a sports stadium as well. And that was a, obviously a fantastic day because we won as well to one. But mm. um, yeah, no, it was it was great. Yeah, if they want a bit of success as well, the Arsenal supporters, they'd be better off following the women's team. We were at the Emirates, I think, on the final day of last season when you were the ones walking around with the silverware. <laughs> I'll get myself in trouble now for saying. <laughs> uh, but no, it's, a, it's a process for Arsenal at the minute. Um, I think Arteta has been fantastic since he's come in. He's put a real structure in place. And obviously uh, the coronavirus hasn't helped. Um, they were gaining a bit of momentum. Um and look, I know everyone's in the same boat at the minute, obviously, from the break. But I think we'll get there, um, definitely. Um, it'll be a little bit of time before that, but uh, she's laughing here beside me. <laughs> um, but no, we'll, we'll get there in the end. I think Arteta is fantastic. Um, obviously, with him after working with Pep at Man City, um, he's got a lot of experience and he can really bring that to Arsenal. Talking about big crowds, uh, it must have been so, uh, so brilliant to see the attendances that were turning up at the international games over the last few years and particularly over the last year and big, big packed houses at Tallis Stadium. Some good football being played, some good results as well. Grinding them out probably deserved a little bit more in terms of scorelines in some of the matches before the break for the coronavirus. In terms of getting back and the chance to qualify for a European Championship, albeit pushed back a year, how much have you enjoyed the international setup since Vera Powell came in? 
Yeah, it's been fantastic. Um, I've really enjoyed working with Vera so far. Um, I think she brings a lot um, to the team, um, not just as her experience as a manager and what she's done, but as a player as well. Obviously, she was a past player for the Netherlands, and um, I just think she brings a whole lot of experience, and uh, that's what we need. We need that, that knowledge um, and her structures and training, what she wants to do when and how she shapes us up for games at the end of a camp. Um, it's been it's been going really well. Obviously, we've got those last two wins under our belt against Greece and, and Montenegro. And as you said, we were gaining momentum before this break, and we're just looking now to, to get back um, on the fitness side of things and get back fit for the Germans come September. Ruish, it's been uh, great talking to you. That's a very strong Scottish accent you have. What's the Irish connection? <laughs> Uh, my nanny and granza are actually from Belfast. Okay. okay. Born in Belfast, and yeah, and then obviously I wanted to be a plastic paddy. Yeah. That was that. I'll see you no more. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's working out well so far. Listen, it's been brilliant to the talk to talk to the two of you, and uh, you're very much involved in this campaign as well. That we're encouraging everybody to get behind with Aviva ahead of Pride 2020. Aviva and belong to the Aviva Stadium going to be lit up this Friday. Uh, and they're also donating €50,000 to the LGBT community. Katie McCabe, Risha Littlejohn, very best of luck for the rest of the year. Cheers, Nathan. Thanks Thank you. Much. Have a good one. Still scoreless between Spurs and West Ham. Five minutes gone in the second half. Quick break and we'll talk to Kevin Kilban. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. When you've watched more Belarusia Premier League than is healthy, proper football is back. Gamble responsibly. See Dunhuey.net. Future of Work with Jess Kelly and Gavin McLaughlin. On the latest Future of Work podcast, we ask if the office as we know it is a thing of the past. John McCartney of Savills talks through the opportunities that exist for companies looking to downgrade their space. Plus, Joe McGinley from Iconic Offices explains the changes they've implemented in their co-working space. Future of Work with Jess Kelly and Gavin McLaughlin. Thanks to Vodafone Business. On News Talk. Listen and subscribe to the podcast now on the News Talk app or on Newstalk.com. Have a great evening with itsforwomen.ie. Don't live your life on hold. Get a quote now at itsforwomen.ie and see why we're trusted by over 130,000 women in Ireland. Maxus Deliver 9 is the newest name in light commercial vehicles in Ireland, distributed by the Harris Group. A van that demands to be driven, the Maxus Deliver 9 range is available now. A complete new platform vehicle of eco technology, high efficiency, low consumption, and a five year warranty. This is the pure driving experience with no compromises. Contact your local Maxus dealer or check out saicmaxus.ie. Maxus, the pure driving experience. Picture yourself on a stunning beach in Connemara, gazing up at the 12 bends, hiking in the national park scenic walk and cycling the Connemara Greenway. Now imagine yourself at Ballina Hinch Castle, enjoying all this and 700 acres of natural beauty. Surround yourself with space this summer at Ballina Hinch Castle, reopening July 1st. Book now at ballinahinchcastle.com. Describe Maynooth University in three words. Skills for life. Gives you choice. Young, bold, progressive. You're in control. Feel so happy! Choose the university that puts you first. Best decision ever. Online Open Day, June 27th. Visit openday.manuthuniversity.ie. Manuth University. No, no bounds. Live football is screened back into action on Premier Sports. Superb goal! We have an incredible 15 live Premier League games and we are your home for Serie A and La Liga. And what a wonderful goal! Tomorrow we have two live Premier League games including Manchester United versus Sheffield United and Norwich versus Everton, both kicking off at six. Premier Sports is available exclusive to Sky Island via the Sports Extra Pack. Visit Sky for more details. Missing this? This is the dream. Shohi on Bring Lord. Whether you're from Cushendall in Antrim or Mount Sinai in Watford, this is what it's all about. And get this the all new OTB Sports app. Off the Ball, Ireland's premier sports channel, now has a new home featuring the biggest names in Irish and world sports podcasts, interviews, news, commentary, analysis. 
Plus, almost 20 years of sporting archives. All free, ready when you are, at home or on the go. The new OTB Sports app. Download it now from the App Store and Google Play. The first ever BMW 2 Series Grand Coupe has arrived at Frank Keane. The embodiment of a new generation of compact BMW coupes, the 2 Series Grand Coupe is available from just €270 Euro per month. With low APRs across the 202 BMW and Mini range, embrace the road ahead with Frank Keane BMW. Visit frankkeenbmw.ie and frankkeenmini.ie to book your test drive today. Lending criteria, terms and conditions apply. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. When you've seen West Ham beat Preston in the 1963 FA Cup final for the sixth time, live football is back. Gamble responsibly, cwe.net. Brace yourself, listeners. He has emerged, bare-chested from Lake Ontario. The prodigal son has returned. Kevin Kilban, good evening. Oh, you're such a clown, aren't you? Oh, you got to, thank God you're wearing a T-shirt this time. Bloody hell. How are you doing? I'm are you all right. Doing? How are you? You're, Jesus, I'll tell you what, you're looking well. Really? Am I? <laughs> Turns out getting away from us was good for your health. Yeah, exactly. Staying out of the pubs. I think I think everyone that's been able to stay out of the pubs during the uh, during the coronavirus has probably been uh, saved a little bit as well, haven't they? How are you keeping? How's all in Canada? Everything's good. Everything's great. Thanks, yeah. Not bad at all. Just... Um, yeah, watched a bit, watched a few of the games here and there over the last few days, which has been great. It's been nice to watch a bit of live footy, hasn't it? So everything's great. Otherwise, oh, no dramas at all. No trips home. I presume you didn't expect to be over there for five months straight. No, no I didn't. I didn't. I was, I was coming over for a week or two initially, and then I had to get back to sort loads out. But I've not been able to get back, so that's been the big problem, hasn't it? So here we are, still here. Where's Maguire? Where's the dog? Still, he's still over in London, actually. He's still right. down in London, so I've had to. Yeah, he's been he's been babysitting, or he's been babysitting there down there. So that's been a. Uh, anyway, that, that's that's another issue. That's for, that's for another day. <laughs> right, right. Let's talk football. You've been watching some football. Uh, you're being missed on the various different media outlets that you would generally work for. So this is for once an actual exclusive, getting your thoughts. Uh, so <laughs> let's talk. What has stood out for you over the uh, last week or so of football? Uh. I mean, I, I've enjoyed watching Man City. It's easy to say with the goals that they scored, but I, I think they seem to me like they're playing at a, a, a different tempo than, than most of the other teams that I've, that I've played against, which is it's fair enough when you watch City anyway. A lot of the other games that, that I've watched, I, I think they have been fairly slow to start with. They're not, they're not usual Premier League games when you watch mm. the first 20 minutes. And that has to be down to the lack of atmosphere that, that, that's at the game and that maybe that little bit of an intense feeling that, that comes around with the, uh, the the supporters that's at the match. And, yeah, I, I've enjoy, I said I've enjoyed it. I've, I've enjoyed watching the, the, the live uh, the live games again, but I, I just think that a lot of the games have been lacking that real ferociousness that maybe getting to this stage of the season you normally get in, in one or two of those matches, particularly at the bottom of the league as well. So... It's, it's wide open at the bottom, as, as we well know. And West Ham are putting up a decent fight there to, to Tottenham, as it looks uh, right now as well. So I think it's just been difficult to really to gauge because of, because of the lack of crowd. And I think it was mm. always going to be that way when you look at it. Yeah, both today's games have really lacked that ferociousness. It's still scoreless between Spurs and West yeah. Ham. 56 minutes gone, finished scoreless as well between Leicester and Brighton. Kenny Cunningham was on at the weekend. and He, he didn't think that the lack of a crowd would or really should make much of a difference, that players are professional, that whether it's a training ground, yeah. that you have a level of focus and professionalism that you bring into every match, and that essentially you block out the crowd. Would you have a different mm. view on the importance of crowds yeah. at matches? I'd have a different view of that, totally. I, I, I don't think there's any coincidence why Newcastle scored three goals against Sheffield United last time out, because you've been up to St James's Park enough times 15, 20 minutes into a game, if Newcastle haven't scored, there is a little bit of a negative feeling that starts to set in around the ground. The players start to feel edgy. It shouldn't be the case, but it certainly is mm. the case. And I think Newcastle were able to express themselves a little bit more. They played with a little bit more freedom. And it, 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 There's no coincidence why Newcastle scored three in that game. You, I mean, you, you'll need to look at Sunderland and look where Sunderland have gone to. I'm, I'm judging it from a team that, that I played at. The one thing that we always said when I played against Sunderland was, look, get through 15 minutes of the game, the crowd will get on the uh, on the players' backs and they will seriously struggle. Nuk but the Sunderland, they had a year without winning a game at home. If, if Sunderland were in this position now when they went through that bad run, 
they simply wouldn't have gone a year without winning uh, without winning a game at home. I, I can guarantee that because you know if I'm, I'm I'm looking at those two clubs from the northeast of England, Sunderland and uh, and Newcastle, and if things aren't going right early for those two teams, they the crowd do get on the back and the crowd have that negative feeling and a lot of the players that have played for those clubs as well have constantly said even when I've been speaking to them over the years look the crowd here they're tough they're tough on us if things aren't going right so I think it, it certainly helps teams like Newcastle and as I said it's no coincidence that they scored the three goals You might have thought it might help a team like Arsenal as well at home considering the way that their crowd has got on their backs very early in games yeah. They've lost their two matches. Both of them were, well, away from home. And yeah. the game against Brighton, the manner of the defeat, uh, the clash at the end of the game where Guendouzi grabs Mopé, somehow Guendouzi doesn't end up with a suspension. But the comments from both where Mopé feels that he has the right to criticise the Arsenal players and question their mentality and say that they need to be a little bit more humble. And then mm. what we hear afterwards, that Guendouzi was basically mouthing for the entire match, uh, slagging them off about how much they earned and basically yeah. mentioning what Mesut Ozil earned and how he earns more in a week than they'll earn in the year and will ever earn throughout their careers. And this sort of really unsavoury nonsense from mm. a young player in a very underachieving and unsuccessful team. Uh, like, is, Are we overreacting? Is that sort of chit-chat during a game, that sort of sledging, is that par for the course and just when it goes horribly wrong like it did, it becomes a big issue or is actually that something you'd look at and go, that's, that's a bit off? Well, that's Arsenal. That's, that's what the players have been like for over 10 years, 10 or 15 years now. And it's no coincidence that Arsenal have lacked the success or had little success during the, during the last uh, 10 or 15 years. I know they've won FA Cups, yeah, but they realistically they've been nowhere near it many times in in the Premier League, and a lot of the players, I feel, have lacked discipline over the years. I do. I honestly feel that. Yes, you look at the professionalism on the pitch when maybe things aren't going right, and they maybe concede two or three goals in a game. They, they let a game slip away from them, but that type of thing is part of the course with Arsenal. I, I didn't necessarily see it from any, any of the other top sides. Sledging, of course, that happens constantly. You'll you'll get various mouth mouthpieces on a football pitch and I've played against many of those over the years and you, and you just take it you take it like a, a, with a pinch of salt but Arsenal for some reason I don't know what it was I, I, I personally think something went wrong 10 or 15 years ago when they, when they went through this lean spell something went wrong because they lost that real leadership that they had when Wenger took over during the 90s Adam Bold Keon whoever Dixon I think that passed on to the next generation of Vieira and Perez and all these sort of players that, that went through that uh, Arsenal dressing room to the stage that they're at now where something went seriously wrong, that the, the discipline wasn't there from within that dressing room. That, in turn, has has filtered over to the pitch now as well. And as I said, it's no coincidence that the, the Genduzi and, and and what have you, what you, whatever you were saying to the Brighton players, the Brighton players have just got a laugh in the faces. They ended up winning the game, and I'm sure mm. that would have been the case. There'd have been plenty of banter and, and sledging going down the tunnel after the game. But, you know, what, what, what a lot of these players, what would you do if you were playing street football? You'd get a slap. They're protected by the, by, by, by the game itself in many respects. And, and I think what, what Brighton did was, was perfect for them. Beat them get get them get them put aside and Mikel Arteta's got a bigger job I feel there at that club than many thought yes they had a turnaround which naturally happens anyway because Arteta's gone in with a different sort of mindset and he started to get results initially but we've we've seen this with Arsenal so often that happened under Unai Emery after Wenger left they got results and then it went back to same old Arsenal there's got to be a massive change within that club. And I think Arteta knows that. Mm. There's got to be a massive change of the club's mentality within that dressing room to get the results right on the pitch because it, it, it hasn't been working. And I honestly feel it, it's the serious lack of discipline that's gone right through that club from, uh, from, from that dressing room, yeah. Yeah, it'll be fascinating to hear what Mikel Arteta has to say about it and what action, if any, he takes against Guendouzi because there's just a complete and utter lack of class from those sort of yeah. comments, particularly from a club. And I know it's interesting you say the last 10, 15 years, because for so long, Arsenal were seen as such a classy club that did things exactly. the right way on and off the pitch. Can you put your finger on what the turning point was? And was it something you, when you were playing that you would have noticed the change in the players' attitudes from that hugely successful era into the Arsenal era that has gone on now at this stage for a decade and a half that have had little or no success? 
Yeah, I mean, I, when I stepped into the Premier League, um, it was late 90s, um, early 2000s, when I was playing against those seriously great Arsenal sides. So I was fortunate enough to play against some of those players that I spoke about earlier on and, and Adams. And well, I mean, I, I actually, we actually had Steve Bold at Sunderland with us for uh, for a while. But the, the back end of those players, Dixon, Dixon was a player. He was a, he was a brilliant, actually, a brilliant footballer to top. You know, he, he kicked the shite out of you, but also... He had a bit of class about him as well. And I think that's what they had. And I think it was discipline. I think it was it was set from the, the, the hierarchy within that dressing room. And anybody knew that walked in. I mean, I, I mean, I remember listening to Lee Dixon. He was on quite recently on the show, wasn't mm. he, talking about this, that whenever anyone walked into a dressing room, you were actually disciplined by the players that were in that dressing room. And they, and then everything else seemed to take place. There was, there was no pressure on Wenger to discipline that dressing room. Wenger, from what you hear about Arsene Wenger's mentality has always been... Just let the team go out and play. Just let them go in and express themselves. And maybe, maybe after that, that core of of, uh, of player left that dressing room, that weren't able to maybe bring that uh, sort of discipline over to the rest of that uh, that group of players and, and new players that were coming in. Maybe it was then. I'd say maybe mid two thousands. I mean, and, and I suppose it's easy to say when when they've had that lack of success, but. The, the mentality has certainly switched after they had that great season where they, where they went unbeaten. It's no coincidence to me with the, with the calibre of player and calibre of man, I think, that they had within that dressing room that they've gone the way that they've gone. Fabregas was, was the one, I think you've spoken about this before, who was probably a little bit too mouthy. Was it giving him too much power, too much, too much of a leadership role at a young age that, that caused a lot of the problems? Yeah, I, I, maybe, maybe. Um, I mean, I, I, do you know what? I, if you're winning trophies, it doesn't matter, does it? That's the thing. Mm. But Arsenal haven't been winning trophies. And as I said before, I don't think it's any coincidence that Arsenal haven't been winning the trophies with that lack of... And I'd say leadership. You, you can be a mouth box. As I said, if, if Fabregas is going to come up to me in the street and give me some of the mouth that he would have given me or, or others on a, on, a, on a football pitch, what would he do? He'd get a slap and he'd be, he'd be put in his box straight away. But he's protected, so he knows he's protected. So... He's, he's, he, he feels as though he has a right to go around shouting his mouth off any which way he wants. So it's it it I, I feel as though as I said I mean the same before that the ha- the house had turned. I, I I wouldn't want to single anyone out. It wasn't just Fabregas, and I know Fabregas. Yeah, he was a bit of a tool at times, but there was many others. I feel as though that was in in the ranks there at Arsenal that were a bit like that, and I felt as though that that was bred into the club with all those young players that were coming through the system and. I feel as though that they were always on a hiding to nothing with the, with the type of character that they had maybe at the head of that dressing room, yeah. And was it always about money? Was was that what they always felt they had over you, that they were at a big club, so therefore they knew they were on a higher salary? I've heard, I've heard others. You know what, Nathan? I've heard, I've heard people that you know that were on <laughs> comparable salaries to you with with that sort of uh, mouthing off over the years. It's not necessarily that. No, I, I have to say maybe I didn't necessarily hear that for, that sort of carry on from from Fabregas. I don't I don't think I did. Not that I can remember anyway. It was just more the the lack of respect that you had for a fellow professional. Like as I was saying before, I would have mouthed off maybe at times on a football pitch at certain players. Someone's give you a dig. You get you try to get them back. It just happens on a football pitch that you're going to give each other a bit of grief and a, 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 a mouth off at each other and sledge each other a little bit. That, that's what happens. But when when they take when they go beyond it, and they start to talk about money. It's just ridiculous, isn't it? It's just like ah, come on, mate. Just you know what what sort of uh, insecurities have you got within your own life that you actually need to bring this up? And if if and when players are bringing that sort of thing up, I used to laugh at them. And as I said, it wasn't necessarily Arsenal. It was other I mean, players that were way less. Uh, of a standard than Arsenal, but were maybe even worse at that. So, I suppose it's just uh, it's just the nature. Some people maybe feel as though that that's uh, that's going to make them feel like the, the the big shot around town if they're yeah. doing that. Spurs won West Ham nil midway through the second half. Who scored? Have ju- an own goal. Thomas Suchek oh. uh, was a corner kick that wasn't dealt with, and he was just in a slightly unorthodox position. Came off the back of his leg and into the back of the net. So Spurs lead West Ham by a goal to nil. Uh, that would move Spurs onto 45 points. They'd be one point behind both Manchester United and Wolves, albeit haven't played a game more. Of course, Manchester United take on Sheffield United tomorrow night in a game. Sheffield United just a point behind uh, Spurs. So Sheffield United still right in the mix despite a really poor start uh, since football came back. West Ham, as it stands, just outside the relegation zone on goal difference. Uh, really hasn't happened for Dev Moyes. We might come back to that. Just, just on Arsenal and that job Mikel Arteta faces and whether he's capable of turning this around. Because the more you look into Arsenal and 
the finances of the club and how it's been run over the last couple of years and the influence of certain ages, agents and the lack of quality individually throughout that side, defensively in midfield, the attacking talent of Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, who a lot of people feel turns it on when he feels like it, but is also just a year left in his contract, could end up leaving. Saka, their best young talent, just a year left in his contract, could potentially leave as well. For Mikel mm. Arteta, for his first managerial job, this would be a heck of an achievement if he somehow turned this round at Arsenal and in the next 18 months turned them into even a, a team that could compete for a Champions League place. Yeah, I mean, I, I was alongside Mikel at Everton. Mikel is a, is a good guy. You, I really want him to succeed there. But as, as I was saying earlier, he will know full well the deficiencies that's within that club from when he first went there as a player Maybe the mentality wasn't quite right within that dressing room even then. Well, it, I, it certainly wasn't. I, I can guarantee that now. And I think there's certain things that he's maybe got to put right. You mentioned maybe individual talent earlier. And I'd, I'd say Arsenal, in fairness, have had the first share of individual talented, individually talented players over the years. It's been about the collective, hasn't it? It's been maybe about one or two players not quite putting it in at certain times. It's maybe been the work rate or the desire that's been within that dressing room and, and, and that's transformed onto the pitch. And I, I'm sure that's the case that Mikel has to address. He, I'm sure he's going in there with bright ideas, of course, working with Pep Guardiola at City. He's got so, so many ideas that he wants to bring to the team. But it, it's not just about coaching the 1-11 to, to to get a result or the 1-14 to 14 or the, whatever it is that you're going to use on a, on a match day. It's, it's, it's other little things that you might need. It's that little bit of steel about the side. It's, it's bringing, introducing players that don't necessarily have the individual ability of certain others within that, uh, within that team. And it's, it, that, that individual might need to bring that steel and that character and that leadership. That's something that, that Mikel Arteta, I'm convinced, will know of. And the rebuilding job will have to take a, a lot longer than many thought after getting, what, six or seven decent results that Mikel Arteta got when he first took over. It's about getting results over a long period. And that's what Mikel has to do. And I'm, I'm sure he'll be given that time. It's his first job, of course. He's, got, he's, he's going to have to fail somewhere within, uh, within the first couple of years at the club. But hopefully, if he can get through the first 18 months, two years, which is difficult in itself, mm. if he can get through that spell, I'm sure that he can start to then rebuild. But it's going to take a long time. It really is. It's going to take a long time for Arsenal to get back anywhere near the level that they were 20 years ago. And expectations are high for Arteta because he spent the last couple of years sitting beside Pep Guardiola yeah, exactly. and the hope that something drips down there. From your memories of him, was he someone who you would look at and always knew he'd become a manager? Was he someone who had quite deep thoughts about how the game should be played? Uh, I, I, I don't know what. I, I think that's such a hard thing to assess, really, Nate, when you, when you see so many players over the years. There's certain amounts of luck as well. I, I feel along the way, certain results when, when a coach takes over that might go the way. And... Um, he was a terrific footballer, terrific, terrific player, brilliant player, in fact. Um, so to, to work with him and see his technical ability, that was something. But he, he was a deep thinker, yeah. He wasn't necessarily like a lot of the, the Egypts that we probably had within that Everton dressing room, I'd feel, yeah. So And he did bring maybe a certain amount of professionalism, I would feel, as well, uh, within, within that dressing room at Everton. So he... I, I certainly think that he maybe had that had the mentality, a coach's mentality, even then. Even though he was a lot younger than me, he was maybe a, a player that was always going to go on and, and try and progress in the coaching uh, coaching ranks after after he finished. I, I, I maybe it's only now when you maybe look back and you think that I didn't necessarily think that at the time, but looking back, absolutely had a different mentality or or uh, a slightly different mentality to to one or two others that was in that dressing room at Everton. Yeah. David Moyes obviously was uh, such a crucial part of your success at Everton. You look at what's happening at West Ham at the moment and there is no love for him at all among the West Ham supporters. Just outside the relegation zone, goal difference. He looks a little bit short in ideas. Does he, does he look like a manager who's lost a bit of confidence in his own abilities? I think there's so, so much of a negative feeling around him now. And, you know, I, I think it's hard to, to, to maintain your confidence Certainly, with what happened at United, what happened when he went over to Spain, what happened at Sunderland, it's. It, it, I, I, I think you know, I, I know him. I've known him since I was 15, 16. So I know exactly what he's like. He is a strong, strong-willed man. He has got the character that I do feel can get through it. But when when a negative feeling sets in around a coach, it's so hard for a manager to get through it and start to look beyond that. Maybe that next game and. 
most managers and coaches do that. They try to look beyond three and four games to try and see what's coming around the corner. But it's so hard to do that. And I think that feeling that's set in around him now, it's going to be difficult for him to, to, to overcome that. I feel as though that he should have got the job at West Ham the first time in, in keeping them up in, in, in the mm. short time that he had the last time. He should have got the job then. It's almost as if the club went went stale for, for a while. Then they've come back to him. I think he's... You know, I think initially it looked as though he got a bit of a kick out of them, but the results it was it seven lost seven from nine, I think, going into this yeah. game, and that negative feeling it's um, it, it, it's not going to get better. Certainly, it's not going to get better in when you've got a derby against Spurs and you're not getting the results. Of course, as you say, you know him a long time and played under him. So, what made him such a good coach? Like it is, you have to remind yourself it is 15 years ago now, in some ways, since that peak of the Everton side. I know he kept them consistently good for a long period. Mm. What, what was it at the time that made him such a good coach that, that Manchester United went for him? Well, I, I mean, I, I played alongside him. He, he, he was a, a player coach before I left uh, Preston. He, he wasn't my, my manager then. So I said I, I knew him as, as a captain at the club when I first came into the, into the game. And as a captain, he was brilliant. He was brilliant for me personally. He got, you know, he maybe taught me maybe how to conduct myself a little bit away from the pitch, how to, how to, how to maybe... Uh, look at yourself to get yourself prepared for, for each and every single training session that you're involved in. And that's maybe what I took from him from, from, from such a young age. When he obviously then signed me at Everton, I, I did see a different side of him. Of course, I saw a different side of him because he wasn't the number two. He wasn't the player coach. He wasn't the captain of, and, and the leader within that dressing room. And I saw a different side of him, of course. But I think he got the best out of that Everton dressing room with certainly initially getting the team organised, getting the everyone playing for each other. Don't get me wrong, he had great characters in that Everton uh, in that Everton dressing room. So I think that did help him. But I think overall, he started then to introduce one or two other players. I mentioned Arteta. He had Gravison when he first took over. And, and he started to introduce then Stephen Pienaar. He got Leighton Baines in there, Jolien Lescott, Phil Jagielka, who went on to have great careers there at Everton. The, the, this type of player really started to excel with, with how David Moyes, I feel as though, started to work with... Um, with the, the core of the group, and he, he'd always give one or two individuals a little bit more freedom. I mentioned Gravison, Pinar would have been another that would have got the best out of him, giving him a little bit more freedom. Mikel, in fairness, Mikel Arteta was allowed to play with a bit more freedom. Tim Cahill was a player not necessarily technically gifted, but given license just to roam forward, get into, into goal scoring positions. And he, I feel as though he had that way about him of maybe getting the core of the team seven or eight of the core of the team right and giving a little bit more freedom to one or two others that, that were allowed then to, to maybe to be a little bit less uh, rigid within that team structure. And I think that's how we got results over the years. Yeah, it's a right struggle for him now till the end of the season. West Ham still losing to Spurs by goal to nil, 15 minutes left. Kev, we've got to leave it there. Where is the, uh, where is the, where are you going to celebrate Liverpool's title win? Got a big party Not planned? They've not won it yet, Nathan, have they? But give, give it time, Kev. They're 20 points yeah. here, so yeah. I'd say it's, I'd say it's yeah, nailed on. Even you realise that. I've met a lot of Liverpool fans, as I said, over the last couple of years. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. No, it's, anyway, we'll see, we'll see, Nathan. I'm sure you'll be happy anyway. I'm sure you'll be happy w w when they win it. Football's always the winner for me, Kev. You know that. I, I know that. I know that, yeah. Will you mind yourself? We might get you back for an Allianz League game, I don't know, October sometime with a bit of luck. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see, eh? Good, good, good. All right. Mind yourself. Good stuff. Take it easy. All the best, lad. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. It's not quite a TikTok lip sync of Donald Trump, but it's a close second. Gamble responsibly. See dunlewy.net. Whether you're looking forward to visiting family and friends or driving just for the joy of getting behind the wheel again, you'll find Peugeot as the perfect SUV for making those memorable journeys all the sweeter. The new Peugeot 2008 compact SUV, the full-size 3008, and the 5008 with seven seats as standard, and all with our unique iCockpit interior. Take a test drive at your nearest dealer or visit Peugeot.ie. Peugeot, unboring the future. We're living in Nate. We're gonna drop into downward-facing dog. Yeah, I have. Hang on. I, I have three kids, and and sorry now, I, I'm just a little bit upside down here. Want to talk life insurance while doing yoga in your living room? Now you can. Chat from home by video or phone with your financial broker or advisor about protecting your family with Irish Life. Get peace of mind knowing they're protected and really strengthen your core at the same time. We know Irish Life. We are Irish Life. Irish Life Assurance PLC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. 
the wait is finally over and sport is back on Now TV. It's lights out and away we go! Where you can watch Sky Sports, Premier Sports and BT Sport together and all without a contract. What a fantastic part. So whether there's a day, week or whole month of action you just can't miss, you can now stream the lot. Oh, it's a fabulous goal! This is your sport on your terms. Search Now TV Sports to find out more. 18 plus content streamed by internet. Full terms apply. Make Lyrath Estate part of your 